together. I don't know how you got to get the set still that long. Maybe with a lot of editing, I don't know. But uh, definitely a time to honor our mothers and thank for being able to do so. But today I wanted to talk about in the Bible, not the Gospel of John, although that would have been appropriate, but I wanted to talk about something a little bit different. Today I wanted to talk about a woman of courage. We'll take turn from your Bibles to Judges chapter 4, verses 17 through 23. And we'll look at a woman of courage down there. Most likely someone you haven't really touched on a whole lot, but she's there. That's why you're turning around share the story with you that I found the other day. The room was full of pregnant women and their husbands. The class instructor said, Now, ladies, remember that exercise is very good for you. And walking is especially beneficial. It strengthens your muscles and will make delivery that much easier. So just pace yourself, make plenty of stops, and try to do your walking on a soft grass surface or path. Then the instructor spoke to the men now, now, gentlemen, remember, you and your wife are in this together. It wouldn't hurt you to walk with her. And in fact, that shared experience will be good for you both. The room became very quiet as the men absorbed this information. And after a few moments, a man at the back of the room slowly raised his hand. And when the instructor called on him, the man spoke in slow, measured tones. He said, I was just wondering, would it be all right if she carries a golf bag while we walk? <laughs> <laughs> I have broken the ice. That's a good thing. You know, Mother's Day is, is a special day. Mother's Day is for you ladies here today and ladies everywhere. And I'm glad we get to honor mothers on a day like today because women and mothers deserve to be honored. Just as much as I believe that men and fathers are to be honored as well. Well, why? Why, would, why do we need, why should mothers be honored? Why should fathers be honored? Well, because it can be a hard life that we live. Consider these statistics that I found just here recently. It says 61%. That's how much drug use went up in teenagers between 2016 and the year 2020. 61% increase. 62%. That's the number of teenagers in the 12th grade that have abused alcohol. Now, please understand, I didn't say drink alcohol. I said abuse. There's a difference. 59%. That's the number of teenagers that have misused a drug at least once. And then this final one is just for the state of North Carolina. It says almost 52% of the youth in North Carolina suffered from some episode of depression in this past year. Can you imagine that? His numbers are big. And those are just some of the statistics that I found. If you want to find some more, you wouldn't believe the ones that are out there. But they are. There's a very verifiable ton of information out there that if we took the time to look these things up, they would remind us that being a parent isn't easy. Being a mother isn't easy. That's why God called you to be courageous as a mother. To battle as a mother. Because we live in a time that your kids need you, mom, more than ever. Today I want to offer a bit of encouragement. Today I want to offer a bit of insightfulness to you mothers to remind you that you do not fight this battle alone. Today I want to offer a portrait of a courageous woman in the Bible. So if you will please stand with me, we'll read Judges chapter 4, verses 17 through 23 together. A little unknown woman in the Bible, but she's very courageous in this episode today. Verse 17 starts out like this, it says, But sister of fled, away on foot to the tent of jail, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, the house, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord. Turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him drink and covered him. And in verse 20, he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. 
But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a peg and took a hammer in her hand, and then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went, da until it went down into the ground while he was uh, lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. Would be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer again. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you in prayer. Lord, just wanted to honor our mothers, but offer to offer encouragement to them. And I believe your word does that in many places. And in this one little obscure portion of Judges, we see a woman who is very courageous. <clears throat> very, very bold and brave. And Lord, we live in a time where that courage is needed, that boldness is needed, that bravery is needed. So I pray that today, Lord, your word will speak to us, Lord, that you will open our hearts and our minds to see, Lord, what you have us to see and to, and to understand, to hear the words that we need to hear, and then, Lord, to apply them to our hearts. And I pray for myself, Lord, to something step out of the way. May you take control of the service. May I speak the words that you want me to speak and nothing else. And may hearts and lives be transformed today for you. For in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. There are three points that I want to cover today. Point number one, that there is a battle raging around us. So use your opportunities well. Number two, some things are more important than following the status quo. And number three, our highest motive should be to honor the Lord. So if you consider the point, number one, that there is a battle raging around us, so use your opportunities well. As mothers, I'm addressing you this morning. God, I'll get to you later. Mom, do you know that there's a battle raging around you? Some might say, I've had a hard day at work. I'm tired and worn out all the time, and I can't seem to get it all together. My kids are screaming at each other. I can't find Tommy's backpack nor his homework. We can't find the cat. We can't find the dog. My kids complain that if they're not sitting in front of the TV or playing some game or some sport, that they are bored all the time. Have you been there before? Yes. I get tired of seeing the eye roll. How many mothers have seen the eye roll? One too many times. Grandma and Grandpa don't understand why we don't come to visit more. I don't spend more time with my husband. He doesn't spend more time with me. And I need a 10-day week to get everything done that I need to do in a normal 7-day week. And that's if I don't sleep any at all. So yes, leave your dreams out. I believe that's what most mothers would say. Yes, we're in a battle. And I'd have to say that, yes, you are. But not for the reasons you think. You see, you are in a battle. You're in a battle for your kids. Did you know that? For your relationship with your husband. Did you know that? For your friends. You're in a battle because of the devil, whom I seem to believe we don't like to talk about very much anymore, has determined that if he can wreck the family, that if he can wreck your marriage, if he can wreck your kids, that if husbands quit being husbands and wives quit being wives, that if the kids are inoculated to all the happenings in life by the need to be involved in everything, so much so that they don't have anything to do as declared by our culture, that all they can say is that I'm bored. And when they don't have something readily in front of them that they then, guess what, they're going to find something that will catch their attention. That's going to catch their eye. And you see, without really knowing it, those things that will catch your attention are nothing more than sharks in the water. Do you know what I'm talking about? The devil has determined that if he can get us off track, that we will open the door for those bad things to come in. And it will become a literal hell on earth. Now let me ask you this. Have you watched the news lately? Have you kept up with all that's happening on the internet lately? If you have, then you know we aren't that far from it, are we? Turn your Bibles with me. Look there, it says in Judges. Now, to understand this text, we have to understand the context a little bit. So, I'm going to give you some of that background information without reading it. First, there is a battle that's going on in this text for today. We see that in verses 12 through 16. Israel is living in a time of the Judges. And the pattern that played out time and time again was that Israel would sin against God. 
that God would bring judgment in some form or some way upon Israel, some oppressor would come and oppress them, and then Israel would pray to God, and God would then repent. He would send a judge to judge Israel and lead them out of their servitude. And this pattern continues all throughout the book of Judges. So here, in our particular story for today, Israel was being oppressed by a man named Jabin, who was the king of Canaan. That's all we know about him. And he has this warrior who led his armies named Sisera. Now Israel had cried out to God, and God called Barak, the son of Abinoam. I don't know if I got the name right, but I tried. Through Deborah, the prophetess, to lead Israel out from under the hand of Jabin. And Barak said, of all things, he said, I won't go. Can you believe that? <laughs> I won't go unless Deborah goes with me. Barak, whom God has chosen to work through, said that he wouldn't go unless she went with him. And she said this. This is what Deborah said in verse 9. I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So there's a battle going on. We face battles that occur in our lives all the time, too. And God calls individuals to fight these battles. And sometimes these individuals don't want to go. They back away. So others say, well, I'll do it if you do it with me. But what does God say? God says, the glory that I was going to work for you will not be given to another. And in this case, it's an a woman. So the battle rages on in Barak with Deborah to beat the enemy. Now look at verses 17 through 18 with me. This is what our Bible says. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. So understand, here's this mighty warrior. Sisera, who fought for King Jabin. This one who led his armies, and he gets away on foot, and he literally runs until he gets to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. So why is that so important in our text today? Because the best of verse 17 says this, for there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. Now that doesn't just mean they got along. That doesn't mean that they were best friends and they let their kids play together on the playground. That's not what the language of the Old Testament is saying here. The language of the Old Testament is saying here that there was a peace treaty between them. There was a legal document between them. They would not be at war with one another. So, so here is Jael who comes out to meet Sisera as he fled. And she tells him to come inside and don't be afraid. Did he have something to be afraid of? Well, Yes. He did because Barak was coming after him to kill him. So Sister was afraid and he turns into this tent and she covers him with a rug. Most likely not a rug but a blanket. But she covers him up so that no one could see him. Now let me stop it there for a minute and say this. You see God never puts anything in the Bible that's not there for a reason. God never puts anything in the Bible that doesn't have meaning behind it. And there is a reason why the story of Jael is recorded here in the book of Judges. Because you see, we think that this story is supposed to be about Barak and Deborah. But who do we see here? It's Jael. You see, I think Jael is a very courageous woman. I do. She is living in the midst of a people who have separated themselves from the other Kenites. The Kenites were the ones that Moses' father-in-law came from. And they separated from them and they signed this peace treaty with this wicked king. So, so get this picture in your mind then this morning. Here comes the king's general. Because that's who Sisera was. He was a general. Running. And I have no doubt Jael knew about this battle. But I feel like he didn't know the outcome. Only that there here was the number one man who come running past her tent. So she stops him and bids him come inside and hide him. So she's courageous, right? but not for the reason you think. <clears throat> Often when we ask for a person's signature, we call it a John Hancock, don't we? Put your John Hancock on that document. That's because of all the 56 signatures on the Declaration of Independence, one stands out above the rest. Can you guess what it is? John Hancock. 
He was the first to sign the declaration. He signed it in big, large letters because he wanted to make sure that the king of England could read his name without using glasses. And Mr. Hancock wanted to be very clear where his allegiance lay. He, his commitment to his country was so clear that when King George offered amnesty to all who would cease fighting, John Hancock was among the select few who were left out. I wonder why. Because he made it clear where his allegiance lay. Point number two, some things are more important than following the status quo. If I asked you to define the terms this morning, status quo, what would you say? Most likely you'd say something like this, right? You would say, well, status quo is that which is acceptable in society. Would that be a fair definition? Status quo is that which is acceptable in society. And if you said that, you'd be right. There is a standard out there, this gold word of ours. Actually, there are several standards, really. And if you aren't living up to one or more of them, then people say, well, that person isn't living up to the what? The status quo. Now here's my next question. Who determines what the status quo is? Is there some board, is there a committee is, that meets and who decides what the status quo should be? Is there a special club that people can become a member of who declare what the status quo should be? Does the President of the United States declare what the status quo should be? Does Donald Trump declare what the status quo should be? What about the Supreme Court? You see, none of these people or these groups declare with authority what the status quo is, but they do have an effect on it. So if they don't do it, then who ultimately does? But we do. Did you know that? As members living in the community, we set the status quo for others around us. Now let me give you an example. Now let's just say, for example's sake, that you move to this nice beach colony somewhere. And in this beach colony, there's all these nice paved paths that people like to walk on. And these paths lead down to the beach, or they lead over to the grocery store. You don't even have to get in your car and go anywhere because you can either walk on the path or you can ride in your trusty golf cart. They've seen those. Now, once having moved there and you've lived there for a while, and let's just say you choose not to get a golf cart to drive around, are you considered to be meeting the status quo then? Most likely not. And no, it doesn't matter what you think because in the opinion of the majority that sets that standard, you, you live in a time. You live in a place where you don't meet the status quo. You see, we live in a time when the, the opinion of the majority sets the standard for the minority. And sadly, the opinion of the majority is that God really doesn't matter. Church really doesn't matter. If you ask people, that's what they'll say. Your kids, bless their hearts. You've been blessed with wonderful children. And we've seen many here this morning. You've been blessed with a fantastic family. But don't you worry about them because the good old government will tell you what's the best for them. And if you haven't seen that one coming yet, you wait. It's on its way. So in the meantime, go ahead and don't worry about teaching them what's right or wrong. Don't worry about teaching them to think for themselves. Don't worry about getting them to be creative, to become good managers of time, or even better than that. What it means to be one of those religious fanatics who likes to go to church and pray. Don't worry about teaching them that or teaching them to be a good citizen of the United States. Don't worry about any of that because we will do that for you. Do you believe that's coming? That is a message that is lingering in the background of our society in which we live. And it will soon be, if not already, the status quo. It's scary, isn't it? Because there are times where it is appropriate to buck the system. We have to consider what that status quo is because there are times where it's appropriate to bug the system. There are times where it's appropriate to stand up for yourself and your family, to stand up for what is right despite overwhelming the odds of the contrary. To do so would be to show courage. And that's why I believe Jail did here. Look at verses 19 to 21 with me. It says, And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. So she opened the skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand in the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael the wife of Hebrew really took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand, and she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground, and he died while he was fast asleep from weariness. 
So here is Sisera, this general of the now defeated army of Jabin. He has found a place where he thinks that he is saved. This tribe that he goes to has signed a peace treaty with his king. So once the apparent threat seems to have passed away, what does he do? Well, he says, I'm thirsty. Can I have some water? Not a bad request, is it? He's thirsty. He's been running. We understand that. He's a little parched. The jail of the good hostess does according to the customs of that town. Or I dare say the status quo of the day. She gets him something to drink, but it's not water, it's milk. Now there's a lot of people who can't figure out what the milk really means, and I don't really know that it means anything other than the fact that maybe she gave it to him to help relax him so he would go to sleep. You know the, the old saying, if you have a child that's having a hard time going to sleep, give them a warm cup of milk that settles them. Maybe that's what she was doing. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say all we know is that this is what she did. This is what she did next that catches my eye. Because Sisera says, stand at the opening of the tent. If any one man comes and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. Now it's no longer a request, is it? He's giving her a command. Maybe Sisera was getting a little more comfortable in his nice fur blanket and cup of warm milk. Maybe with this apparent protection around him, he felt a little more his element as a man who could give orders to anyone that would obey. For whatever reason, Sisera asked Jael to stand at the door of the tent, and if anyone came by asking if anyone was there, she was to say no. But did she do it? No. You see, good old Sisera had laid down and fallen asleep from his weariness. That's what the Bible says. This man who was said to be the commander of Jabin's army and who had 900 chariots of iron at his disposal. The Bible says that he oppressed the people of Israel for 20, I'm sure, long years. Now, now sometimes we take the surface reading of the Bible, don't we? We'll, we'll read through something pretty quick and we just kind of skip over words and we don't really get the nitty gritty of what's being said here. So, so we leave not really understanding, like for example, words such as this, oppressed. We don't really understand what it means in this context. But I'm sure, for instance, if you ask one of our brothers or sisters of color, they would give you a good definition, wouldn't they? I'm sure that you would get an answer you never thought of. He oppressed the people of Israel for 20 years. Now, now did he and his men rape women? Most likely. How can I say that? Well, listen to verse 28 of chapter 5. I'll read it to you. This is the song that Barak and Deborah sang at the victory of Israel over Sisera. Now listen to these words. Out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera, wailed through the lattice. Why is this chariot <clears throat> so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of this chariot? Her wisest princesses answered. Indeed, she answered herself. Had they not found and divided the spoil, a womb or two for every man? Spoil of dyed material for Sisera, spoil of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as foil. Now, did you catch that one little phrase out of the whole song that I, uh, I kind of tried to emphasize a little bit there? They said, a womb or two for every man. Sounds to me like they were very familiar with raping and pillaging, don't it? Did they kill people? Most likely. Did they kill children? Most likely. Why? Well, because children didn't mean very much back then. They did not carry the value that they do today. My point is that here is this man who has horribly oppressed Israel for the last 20 years. He is on the run. He comes to jail seeking refuge, and she gives it to him. Now, I can't help but wonder what she knows about him, and we really don't know at this point. But I'm thinking she knows something, at least, of his character. Then he stands her to stand guard at the door. Maybe he thinks he's in a free and clear now. Maybe he feels more secure now. He starts falling back in his old habits of thinking and acting. And he starts bossing her around. I don't know. Now what does she do? Well, she doesn't listen, does she? The Bible says that she took a tent peg and a hammer in her hand. Now I want you to get this picture again in your mind of this scene I'm trying to paint for you this morning. It's the inside of a tent, a big tent. They had big tents in those days. Cicero has fallen asleep, and Jael goes to the corner, and she picks up this big old hammer. Charlie, you know what a big old hammer is, right? Which they use to drive tent pegs into the ground, and she picks up a tent peg. Now, I'm not talking about the Walmart brand tent pegs, 
understand. I'm not talking about a little six inch job like this. These big tents needed a great big peg because they had to understand the storms of that day. They had to hold the tents in place. So here she is literally with a giant spike and a hammer in her hand. And the Bible says that she went softly to him. Sounds a little premeditated, doesn't it? And she drove that spike into his temple and down into the ground while he was sleeping and killed him. I want to step back from that picture and notice something. You see, the standards of what the standards of that day did not allow women to stand in the doorway of a tent and invite men in who were not part of the family. As a woman, you just didn't do that. In that day and time, women were subservient to men, meaning that whatever the men told them to do, they did it. But did she? No. She did get him something to drink, though, but it wasn't water. She did of her own accord to give him a nice blanket to cover her bed, but did she stand at the door and keep watch? No. Why? Because she went over and picked up a hammer and spike and proceeded to kill him. The man who with 900 chariots of iron oppressed Israel for 20 years. One commentator noted that Jael's husband, because of the tribe that he was in, most likely worked in iron. And since there was a treaty between his people and King Jabin, most likely he worked on some of those iron chariots for Sisera. So Jael would have known Sisera, and that's most likely why he felt safe inside her tent. But given the testimony of Barak and Deborah, Sisera and his men were known for raping and taking women. And most likely, I'm sure that Sisera shared his exploits with her husband. What I mean by that is kind of like how men do today. When you gather around a bunch of guys at the auto mechanic shop and you're just talking and you feel comfortable, you talk about what you've done well, right? Man, if Glenn was here, I'd talk about fishing. You'd share about how big that fish was you caught on that Saturday. Or you would talk about the new truck you purchased or the different things like that. You talk about the things that you are proud of because you're comfortable. So if this is true, and it very well could be, then Jail could have possibly heard of all that he had done of the atrocities that he had committed. Either way, commentators all agree that God must have put killing them in his, her heart because her heart was ready and she was willing to go against the status quo of today. But let's please understand something here this morning. I have to say this. I'm in no way advocating that you go out and kill someone tomorrow. What? Not at all. Even if your husband didn't get you anything like for Mother's Day, don't kill him. This sermon today does not give you permission to kill. But what I am advocating for you is that you kill sin when you see it. Yeah. In case you haven't picked up on my clues yet, there is a force out there in our culture, in our society, that is hell-bent on destroying what every one of you have here in this room. No, it's not Trump, and it's not Biden. As I'm sure many think that he wants to. It's, it's not our government or the school systems. It's not even the terrorist who walks into a crowded bus terminal and blows himself up with everybody else there and is so doing he thinks he's going straight to heaven. And it's certainly not the kid who walks into school and shoots several of his classmates. You see, we like to think it's all of those. But in reality, they're, they're only tools in the hands of the devil. And his favorite tool is sin. You see, sin is like a pie bar. Pie bars are good, aren't they? If you get a nice, big, strong, straight pie bar, you got a little bit of a gap there. If you get that pie bar in there, you can pry the lid off of anything. Pie bars are a wonderful tool. You see, Jesus didn't give in to the social conventions of his day. He denounced religious rules for heaping impossible burdens on those who were unable to keep them. He touched lepers even though the rules of his day said that doing so would make him unclean. Jesus, he healed on the Sabbath even though no work was supposed to be done. Jesus stood out against the status quo of his day because it led to sin. And it's like one person said one time, he said, you better be killing sin or be killing you. You see, I don't care who you are as a person. Your house is not as safe as you think it is from sin. What I mean by that is, don't think that you can go home and shut out the filth of the world and the nastiness of the world simply because you shut the door behind you. Because I guarantee that if you're not on the lookout to keep the depravity from society from entering your house, I promise you that it will find a way in. Why? Well, because you have the devil there with the crowbar who is trying to cherish part of what you have. Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, 
that thief comes to only steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may, might have life and have it abundantly. So the devil has a desire for your life. That's what Jesus says. He wants to destroy it. And one of his best ways of doing that is from the inside out. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but the Bible describes the devil in Revelation 22 as this, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. <clears throat> and the best way to kill a snake is to what? You cut off his head. Mothers, when sin comes into your house, I pray that you be like jail. That you be intentional in seeking it out, and that you like here drive a big old spike right through its head to kill it. Because our highest motives to be in honor of the Lord. That's our last point this morning. You see, the story is told about an old farm couple who were driving along in their pickup when the wife said, you know, we never set all snuggled up like we used to when we were dating. And the husband looked at her and said, I have a mood. God is not a mood. Did you know that? In tumultuous times when the whole world seems to, be, to have gone crazy, when the culture is shifting and society is changing faster than the blink of an eye, at times when we feel like we've been left behind to fend for ourselves, our children, our families, it is paramount that we remember this truth. God has not moved. Did you know that? Who has? So you might be wondering why I thought at this point our house motives would be to honor the Lord. The reason I did is because if that is truly your motive, then you will remain right where you need to be. Now let me ask you this. Do you think Job was seeking to honor the Lord in our scripture text for today? I honestly cannot tell you if she is. But what I can tell you is this, that she was certainly up to something. And it is my opinion that she was attempting to do what God had put in her heart, to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And why can I say that? Well, because of the clues given in the text. Look at verses 22 to 23 with me. It says, And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jill went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead in the tent paving his temple. And verse 23 says, And so on that day God subdued Jabe and the king of Canaan before the people of Israel. Now, now here is Barak. He's chasing Sisera. The Bible says that as Barak was obviously passing by, that Jill went out to meet him, and she said what to him? She said, come in, I'm going to show you the man you're looking for. Now, obviously, sister is dead. We don't need to touch on that anymore. But my question is, how did she know, number one, who Barak was, and then number two, who was he looking for? Could it have been divine revelation? I don't know what the Bible doesn't say. Or could it be that she was able to keep up with the times? To keep up with the time she would, uh, to keep up with what was going on around her so she knew the threats that were out there. You see, I think it's both. I tend to think it's both because verse 24 says that God subdued Jabin, uh, Jabin that day. And how else could God have done this if he had not acted through jail? You see, ladies, jail was a tool in the hand of the Creator. <laughs> Mothers, you are a tool in the hand of the Creator as well. Did you know that? You are a tool that God Almighty uses not only to affect the society in which you live for His glory. That's what you're supposed to do for His glory because that's what happened here. God was ultimately glorified through the actions of jail because she was working for the kingdom and not for herself. And how can I tell? Well, verse 24, chapter 5 says this. Most blessed of women be jail, the wife of Hebrew the Kenite. Of ten dwelling women, most blessed. The author of the book of Judges says that Jill was most blessed. Not just blessed, she was most blessed. Why? Because she enacted the judgment of God where it was needed. She was faithful and she was obedient to what she knew was a bad situation. So mothers, you are a tool in the hand of the Creator because you are called to be both faithful and obedient to the situation that you have at hand. And that is your husband, your children, and your family. The most important thing to You are called to be faithful, and we live in a time where the faithfulness and obedience is desperately needed. You see, God said in Psalm 127, 3 and 5, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is their reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. You see, children are a gift. 
But they are not something that you take and turn loose in your backyard and say, you just have at it, I'll find you in 18 years to see how it works out. We don't do that because that'd be foolish. Because God also says this, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So you see, you've got to train them up. You've got to, <clears throat> you've got to roll up those sleeves and apply some elbow grease and get a little busy, get a little dirty, because kids won't get there on their own. Their sinful nature without, within them won't allow it. And if you leave them to their sinful state, it's going to take them where it's natural for them to go. And the Bible says that's to hell. So you've got some work to do because when those dear babies grow up, God has a plan for their lives that you are to help them reach. And Psalm 127 says, like arrows in the hand of a mighty man are children in his youth. What, what do you do with the arrows? Do you put them on the shelf and not even look at them anymore? Do you put them up in the yard and put little lights around them for Christmas time? You know what I'm talking about? Do you do that with the arrows? No. You get you a good old bow and you go out there and you shoot those arrows. In the day of battle, as a warrior, you put those arrows in your bow and you shoot them out at the enemy. Now, do you do that just for fun? And I hold back and did it. No. You do it with intentionality because you're engaged in a conflict and you are claiming more territory for King Jesus. Now, ladies and moms, I want you to understand something here today. If you've got nothing from any of that, you please get this. The gifts that you have been given from God, your husband, your children, your families, they are indeed gifts, the gifts that you can never take for granted. Because there is one out there who will do all that he can. And he is smarter than you, he is stronger than you, and he's had a very long time to perfect his craft. And he will do all that he can to destroy what you have. So be wary. Not weary, but wary. Just don't be on guard. Be on the offense. Take the battle to him because I promise you, if you don't, it's coming to you. It most likely already is in your home. The threat of such conflict likely already resonates through the decisions that you are making. And without a relationship with Jesus and the knowledge that he can only provide, I'm sorry, but you're going to make more decisions. That can have eternal consequences. The Bible says in Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. That means that he is both your defender and the one that will help you press the battle. Now, guys, love your wives and support them. Because just as much as you have an important job, so do they, and you both need each other. In church, support the young brothers in your midst. Don't be afraid to serve in the nursery or children's church or, or even the wanna. Yes, you may say, well, I've already served my time, and I get that, but that's not really biblical because if God was done with you, you would already be home in glory. So if you're in here, guess what? you got more work to do. So support those young mothers who are in our church. Give them a chance to actually be in church so they can be refreshed and encouraged by God's word, so they can be refueled to take the fight to the devil. And moms, oh, my ladies, Love what you've been given well as Christ loves them. Both your husband and your kids. I love them unconditionally. And protect them. And find that snake of sin when it sneaks into your life and kill it. The Lord be killing you and what you have. So look back here with your eyes. Probably we've been challenged today. I have. I'm breathing the wound. But we've been challenged today, Father, Lord, just with uh, the reality of sin in our midst and a culture that wants to sneak in and, and take what we have. The devil's behind it, we know that, and the people are his tools and his instruments, and we are the silent majority. Uh, we are the silent minority and a strong majority who wants to change the world for the worse. So, Lord, my prayer today, Lord, is for these mothers and fathers and the church to stand up and help mothers and families to be what they need to be, to... to, to <clears throat> Take the job that they have as a parent seriously. Because at times we're not going to allow for uh, a lazy affair approach to mother and my father. The times that we live in is not going to sit back and just say, well, the church is okay over there. They can do what they want. It won't happen. The challenges are coming, if not already here. So, Father, I pray for our families in this church to help them to get a firm understanding of that and to go on the offensive, not just the defense. Help them make the decisions that they need to make 
Lord, to be in alignment with what you want for them. And they know what it is. I don't need to tell them. And Lord, I pray for those who don't have a relationship with Jesus. If they want to know what it means to have that relationship with Jesus, maybe they, they, they know that there is a they know that there's a God, but they've never come to follow under him and say, you are my Lord, you're my king, and I want to follow you and serve you. Lord, if there's someone in here who doesn't know that, then let them come to me today and I will share with them. Or I can put them in touch with someone else who can share with them. Now they can know without a doubt that he's saved. And then for someone here who says, you know, I've got a bunch of errors. I know myself, I've not done nothing, but I'm, it's about time I take them down and get them ready for battle. I'm hoping the battle for them. I pray that they will see that, Lord, and make the decisions that are necessary for them. Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, for what, you, what you've done and what you're going to do. And I pray for this time of the invitation as we continue song. If that the invitation is still open, people can come and speak as they feel led or even pray at the altar. The altar is open. We pray these things in Jesus' name.